Hey, I'm David the Good, and I want to give you permission to be a scientist, to have fun in your garden again, to do experiments, and to discover what works and what doesn't without worrying about all the rules. For the next hour, we are going to have a lot of fun, and I'm going to show you what I'm doing in my gardens and maybe give you some ideas of your own. So are you ready? Let's go and discover better gardening through experimentation. I just want to say, the rumors that I grow varieties of corn specifically to match this shirt are completely unfounded. Let me talk about this corn. I, I only have one hand, so bear with me. This variety of corn is a local grain corn that's been grown in this country for a long time, apparently. We experimented with it and grew it down the hill for the first time and just pulled these in about two weeks ago. The second ear of corn here, this is a really cool one. This is a Missouri pipe corn from Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. This is the type of corn that makes corn cob pipes, like General MacArthur would have smoked. Uh, but it's also a grain corn or a flower corn. Look at how big that is compared to this corn. Totally different, you know, different genetics. Very cool. This third ear of corn here was just given to me by a local farmer for me to try out. He gave me a few ears of it and said, here, you can plant these. I love testing different varieties of corn. Why limit yourself to one or two varieties when you could try a different one every season and then pick out the ones you like? I have no idea where the seeds came from on this. The farmer said that a guy came by, handed him a few ears and said, here, these are for you to grow. Try it out. These are red corn. And so he planted them. And now he did the same for me. And we'll see how they grow, how they taste, if they're easy, if they're productive. It's a lot of fun. Why not experiment? Enjoy yourself a little bit. I've written about this in my books. I grow grain corn rather than sweet corn. Grain corn is more robust, and I really don't like how sweet modern sweet corn is. I love the full flavor of corn, like a really good roasted corn chip type of a flavor. Not that sickly sweet, oh my goodness, put me into a diabetic coma type of corn that you often get now. Grain corn is a survival corn. You can grow it for flour, and if you pick it when they're in the milk stage, you can roast them or boil them just like you would do with sweet corn. It's just a little more starchy rather than sweet, but very delicious, very hearty, and they also produce a lot of biomass, which you can then turn around and put into your compost piles. Grain corn is my favorite corn, and there's so many varieties from flint corns to dent corns that are 14 foot tall to short little corns that are scrappy and produce in a fast season to green corn to blue corn to black corn to multicolored Indian corn. I mean, you could spend your entire life just picking different varieties of corn to grow and never touch a GMO variety. Really fun and great for the kids. You may think you're a terrible gardener because you failed at something, or you failed at a lot of things, but failure is the way you get to success. I have killed more plants than I'll bet a lot of you ever tried to grow. I've killed a lot of things, and it's very sad. I have a very dark history with plants, but now I'm an expert gardener because I kept failing until I figured out which things grow really well. This passion fruit above me, which you can't hardly see, it's all wrapped up in the branches of a tamarind tree. It basically grows itself. But there are other things I've had terrible luck trying to grow here. Like so far I've been a complete failure with watermelons. I'm gonna figure it out though. I keep planting. Passion fruit pretty much grows itself. So 
Either I could just plant more passion fruit, which is a good thing, or I can keep failing on watermelons for a while until I figure that out too. Don't give up just because you failed on something. Plant something different. Try to see what pops up in your yard by itself. Do you have wild plums growing in your yard? Maybe graft some nectarines on top of them. I've done that and it works. Look around, see what your neighbors are growing. They have great success with pear trees. Why not plant a pear tree? You know, if they're having a terrible time with something else, maybe try another variety. Maybe don't try that thing until you feel like you're a little more confident. But don't be afraid of failure. Failure can be the doorway to success in your gardens. And I've failed my way to finding out the easiest things to grow. Stuff I can basically just pick up off the ground. Believe it or not, this is one of my garden beds. I figured something out. I figured out I was making compost in one place, then hauling the compost over to a garden bed, and then planting the garden bed. And meanwhile, the ground beneath the compost pile was awesome, and my garden beds never had enough compost. So, why not combine a garden bed with a compost pile and do this for a year, make a big pile of delicious slop and then plant on it later. Everything wants to grow out of the compost pile anyways. I mean, just take a look at some of the stuff growing out of this compost pile. We've got cocoa, mangoes, yams, papayas, moringa. There's a big squash growing down the fence that came out of this compost pile. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, if I just wanted to mound up a bunch of stuff and let it grow, I could probably plant a forest this way. It saves me a lot of work though. I can cut down the stuff I don't want. I can transplant seedlings if I desire to. I can let the squash go. I got 200 pounds of pumpkins once out of one of my compost piles I did this way. You know, you're probably not gonna get cocoa out of your compost piles unless you happen to have a cocoa orchard in your backyard like we do, but you know, you will get stuff like tomatoes and squash and peppers and other things that just pop up and grow. That's not the important thing though. The important thing is, is we're composting in place with no work. We're not worrying about turning it and all that kind of stuff until it's time to plant. Then we just turn this sucker over and plant on top of it. You can throw some topsoil on it and just plant right into it. And you end up with a lot less work. You're not transporting materials and you have more than enough compost. This garden bed is going to be awesome for the next two years. You know, the soil is just incredible now and it's just getting better every day that we throw more scraps from the kitchen on top of it. This is simple, easy, cool composting, and it's a result of years of experimenting with compost. I just don't wanna work that hard anymore. At this point, I'm sure quite a few of you are wondering, what in the world happened to my hand? Well, this was another experiment. I tried grafting a mulberry branch right onto this finger. Unfortunately, it was rejected by my body and I had to go in for surgery to kind of clean it up a little bit. Not all your experiments are gonna work, but it doesn't stop me from trying. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble, rind of passion fruit, and weeds in my tea. This is the most horrible compost tea you've ever seen in your life. If you subscribe to my YouTube channel, you saw all the bizarre things I put in here.
This is fertility soup. This is some of the best liquid fertilizer you could ever make. And the best thing is, it's free. Now this is very controversial. I posted on this on my YouTube channel and people came in and they told me that I was making bad bacteria, very, very bad. They're very judgmental about these bacteria. It's not the bacteria that I'm so much interested in. If you're doing an aerobic compost tea, you're looking for a specific, you know, you want the peak bacteria to get in the soil and stir things up and do good work for you. In this case, I'm looking for a lot of fertility to stretch over a large space. The first time I did this was in my greenhouse one winter, back when I lived in a place where it still froze. And what I did was is I mixed up a bunch of stuff. I had some manure, because I'd heard of manure tea. I threw in some comfrey, because people make comfrey tea. I threw in some moringa. Moringa is a tropical tree with a lot of nutrition in the leaves. I even threw in some urine, because urine is also a great fertilizer, so long as it's not too strong and it's diluted. So I threw all this stuff into a barrel, and I just let it rot. Anaerobic fermentation, or putrefaction, or whatever you want to call it. But what happens is, all that stuff rots down in there, releases all the minerals and nutrients, and then you take all that stuff and you pour it into your garden beds. So as an experiment, again, experiment, I did this, and I decided to water all the plants in my greenhouse with it. And what happened surprised me. I ended up with rich, green, beautiful growth. Now there was a chance that maybe I made it too strong and I killed it all, and there was a chance that it would grow well, but the level of growth I got was so good that it surprised me, and it was beautiful. And so what I've started doing is when I plant a great big field of stuff, and I don't have, I mean, there's no way to get enough organic nutrients on there without breaking the bank. You can't make enough compost for say, 10,000 square feet of corn, particularly easily. If I wanna get corn in the ground or pumpkins or something like that, what I do now is I clear an area and I just use the native soil that's there, I put a barrel down there and I throw in a bunch of high fertility things. So what can you put in here? We're talking Epsom salts, urine, manure. I will go and cut weeds, take the weeds, throw them in here, let them rot down. Putting a lot of high fertility materials in there. I also add seawater at this point for the sea minerals. I don't live that far from the ocean, so this is pretty easy for me. If you had seaweed or something like that, you gather when you're on vacation to the beach, put it in some bags, you could throw that in here too. As long as you don't have too much salt, it's not gonna burn the plants. This allows you to take a small amount of highly fertile materials, and instead of trying to spread, say, three shovelfuls of chicken manure across a 100-foot row of corn, you could throw them in a barrel, put water on it, let it rot for a bit, and then water continuously so you get a diluted, rich, minerally nitrogen-filled mix going right under the roots of your corn, and it grows like crazy when you do that. Even though this is totally a bad and wrong thing to do, it works, and I discovered that through experimentation. Later on, I discovered the Koreans have been doing this for thousands of years, so it wasn't like it was some idea that I had just come up with, and it was brilliant. If the Koreans copyrighted it, I may get sued on this video. I wanna show you another cool composting experiment that seems to be working well so far. I'm letting you in on the ground floor of this one. We call this one mulchalizing. Take a look at this. This tomato seedling right here was yellow and sad looking and about half this tall a few weeks ago when we planted it. This mulch here is a combination of seaweed and rotten weeds from the compost barrel that have been sitting in that anaerobic tea for a long time, just sitting there and rotting. We mixed it together and then we watered it through to hopefully get rid of some of the sea salt. But a little bit of the sea salt we wanted to be here for the sake of the flavor of the tomatoes. It's actually been proven in studies that tomatoes that were watered with seawater, even though it burned the tomatoes at the beginning, tasted better, which makes a lot of sense. The ocean is very savory if you've ever swallowed a swallow full of seawater. We thought, why not take it and mulch right around these tomatoes so we can mulch and fertilize at the same time. As this seaweed and the other bits of mulch that are rotting and deteriorating here in the ground, they're gonna feed these tomatoes hopefully through the entire season. I'm just excited about this idea. I think it was a cool idea, and uh, I was talking with my wife and we kinda of came up with the idea together. Heck, she may have come up with it, but 
The idea of experimentation goes all over the garden and this is gonna block weeds, it's gonna feed the soil, and it's gonna add minerals that normally would not be in this bed to begin with. And after these tomatoes are gone, those minerals should still be here for quite a while. A lot of these things are gonna stick around. Mulchalizing, I thought it was kind of a cool idea. We're gonna see how it turns out and we're gonna keep updating it on the YouTube channel, but it's really kind of fun. Do you remember the comedian Gallagher? If you grew up in the 90s, like I did, you remember this guy smashing fruit, melons, things like that, smashing them with a hammer. This was giggle-inducing, I suppose. It was a big deal for a while, smashing fruit, but then it kind of just drifted off. We decided to bring it back in the garden. This was another experiment. We figured, you know, Nature drops the fruit to the ground, animals eat it, it gets scattered, smashed, rots, you know, just splattered all over the place. So it took a cantaloupe that was mostly rotten, smashed it up, spread it across this garden bed, and where they grew, they grew. These cantaloupe are very happy. Probably need to be thinned out, but these are gonna get run up onto the fence when they get a little bit bigger. We'll put some strings or sticks here and get them going on the fence. And these are splatter planted cantaloupes, planting like nature does. I mean, it's more fun than putting nice little mounds and trying to pick out what you want, right? Just come into the garden and throw a cantaloupe on the ground, wait a couple of weeks, you're gonna have baby cantaloupes. Better gardening through experimentation, or at least funner gardening, more fun gardening. Gardening that is fun. It happens all the time in nature. A pit spontaneously appears in the ground, two to three feet deep. Then an animal comes and dies and falls into the pit. Dirt spontaneously fills over the top of that animal and then pumpkin seeds just are planted by the winds into the top of it. And vines then cover the hillside, providing thousands of pounds of pumpkins to the deer and the rabbits. No, actually it doesn't. But we did notice, like we said earlier, that everything grows better out of a compost pile. And so the Native Americans had this method, apparently, as recounted by Steve Solomon, and later reenacted by Marjorie Wildcraft after she saw what I did in my Compost Everything movie. They would dig a pit, throw the refuse into it, the ashes, human waste, whatever is left after they make bowstrings out of buffaloes and, and hats and tent pegs and peanut butter. All that stuff would get thrown into a pit and then it would be planted on top of. And the vines from the pumpkins would gather all over the place. You would have sunflowers perhaps or maize or whatever other crops they were growing. So we decided to test that back when I lived in Tennessee I had some friends from Ethiopia and we had some goats slaughtered and we saved the bits of the goat that we didn't want to eat. I took a pit, threw them in there, threw in some raw manure, threw in kitchen scraps and soup and all that kind of stuff and then planted golden Hubbard squash on top of it and they did fantastically. Now I'm doing the same thing on a hillside here but because the soil is acid I have been burning piles of wood and then turning those ashes under and then taking a bunch of rotten raw stuff from the compost pile because of that compost power of pumpkin growing and then planting into it. And as you can see, these little pumpkins here, they're a few weeks old and they are gorgeous. And soon they're going to eat this entire hillside in a completely natural process. one hole in it. It's not bad. A lot of people don't think you can grow fruit trees from seed, but a lot of fruit trees grow well from seed and not just mangoes. We're talking even apples. People will say, why would you do it from seed? I think you don't get anything or it won't make any fruit or it's going to be bad fruit. No, it's not necessarily going to be bad fruit. 
a lot of the fruit that you get from seed grown fruit trees is actually going to be good. You're going to end up with a vigorous tree in a variety that nobody has ever seen before because it is a unique genetic creation. I've grown apples from seed and peaches from seed and citrus from seed, mangoes from seed, a lot of different things from seed and I've had good success with the ones that have started fruiting. Now, granted, this sometimes is a long process. You can get peaches in two to three years from seed, which is amazing. I mean, they grow like a big vegetable. But when it comes to something like apples, you're looking at maybe eight to 10 years. And if you're looking at pecans, it might be 10 to 15 years, but you plant them anyways, because you don't know what you're gonna get. And it's really fun. And you plant a whole bunch of seeds, and then you pick out the ones that you like. like I mean, what does it cost you to start a bunch of peaches? And you've got two to three years before they start producing. You know, start 40 or 50 peach seeds. Next time you're at the farm stand, grab a local variety, pop those pits in. I actually have a video showing you how to do it. You gotta stick them in the fridge first for a little while to stratify them, and then you plant them and they grow. But grow those peaches, plant them all over the place, and then maybe you get a couple of peaches that are just, you know, not up to your standards. So you cut those down, or even better, you pick a couple of little branches off of the ones that are producing fruit that you like and you graft them over onto the ones that you don't like the fruit from. Then you get the benefits of that established root system right there in the ground and it'll be fruiting the next year. I grafted nectarines and peaches onto wild plum and the next year they were fruiting. Just take advantage of that root system that's already there. So don't be afraid to plant trees from seed. I've written all kinds of articles on it. I've experimented with a lot. I've done a lot of videos on it. And it's not only fun, and it's not only like the nature way to grow trees, it's putting a legacy out there. And it's helping different genetics to come forwards that may not be coming forward, you know, in a world that everything is endlessly reproduced in monoculture fields of Red Delicious. Here are some fruit trees that I planted by putting the seeds directly into the ground. It took them over a month to come up, but these are baby jackfruit trees. By getting the seeds right in the ground, I think it's gonna make for a stronger root system, deeper tap roots, and instead of them being transplanted and having to go through transplant shock after they come out of a pot, they can grow those roots straight down, and I'm growing the jackfruit right where I want it to be. Another experiment. As you can see, one of these jackfruit is actually white. The leaves are completely white. This is a mutation causing the plant to be unable to produce its own chlorophyll. This is almost 100% certain to be fatal. So when you do plant trees from seed, you don't always know what you're going to get. So I planted multiple seeds in this one spot. And when you have a mutation right up front that you know is not good, you know, you can let this tree go. But if there's any chance that this tree would live, it would be kind of cool. So I'm letting it grow for now, but I don't think it's gonna go. As you can see, the difference between this one and this tree, which came up at right around the same time, this is a much healthier, more vigorous tree. It's able to feed itself. This one is probably still living on the remnants of the seed beneath the ground and will eventually succumb to the disease, or the diseased DNA. This little apple seedling here is one of those experiments where you really don't exactly know what's going to happen. Eight to ten years, maybe it'll make fruit, but we're in the equatorial tropics. Fortunately, there's a guy that's been experimenting for years. His name is Kevin Hauser, runs Cuffle Creek Apple Nursery. And he wrote a book on growing apples in the tropics, and that caught my attention. I started fooling around with growing apples outside their range when I was in Florida. And now that I live near the equator, I'm continuing it. But to actually get apple trees down here isn't all that easy. Nobody thinks you can grow them, but there are ways. So we went to the grocery store, we bought some apples, we planted the seeds, and we're going to see what happens. This is just for fun. And if we pull off growing apples down here, the sky's the limit. Don't say you've never had a green thumb. Don't try something and then fail and have it die and then never try it again and say, oh well, I give up, I'm a failure. Don't do that. 
part of it is just having a different mindset. And I want to introduce my wife, Rachel, right now and have her share a story about how her mindset on plants was changed. And I think it'll encourage you too. When I was in college, I took a botany class because I needed a, a science and I thought it would be interesting. I liked plants and I thought, well, we'll just take that and I'll see how it goes. And uh, the first day the professor said, today, from, from now on, today, when you're in this class, every one of you is a botanist. And I thought, wow, I'm an honorary botanist in this class. I, that's really encouraging. I get the, uh, the credentials to really think like a scientist, to really examine the problem and come up with a solution, which is what you do in science. You know, sometimes I think people get, get um, oh, it's too sciencey. I don't want to do that. It's, it, but that, that science is fun. You think, you observe, what is the problem? And you think about how you can fix it, how you can solve it. What could, what could be a solution or an answer to the problem? And you, as a gardener, this is all around you. You're in nature. What are the problems in your garden? That's how you can really solve some of the issues that are unique to your specific garden. What is, What are the issues that you're facing? And sure, you can Google the answers, but sometimes all you have to do is just give it some, some thought on your own. You know, is your, did, what grows really well? What doesn't grow really well? Look for things that are in the same family as, as the things that grow well and, and, and bring more of those plants in and try to grow those. And chances are you'll have luck growing those. You know, like if, you're, if your blueberries, for instance, are do, always doing poorly, maybe your soil just is not acid enough for blueberries. And quit growing, quit trying to grow something that's just not going to grow for you. Grow something else that, that will. That's a, that's a problem. Just give it some thought. You, yeah, like I said, you can Google it. Um, but, but have fun in your garden thinking about what what are your challenges in your specific yard and uh have fun thinking about how you can overcome those challenges the 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 solution to your unique garden is as unique as you The other day, just for fun, on the YouTube channel, I posted a video on planting a bag of 13 bean soup. They're coming up right now and they look really good. But I have this extra little spot here at the edge of this garden where all the tomatoes are sprawling sideways and everything's all silly. I decided I'm gonna plant another row. Let's plant 13 beans in a row. Can't actually plant all 13 because some of them are split peas and those won't germinate but we'll get close. I think we can do 11. Big lima bean. Pinto bean. Little red bean. Black bean. Chickpea. There's a lentil. Let's plant two lentils. They're so tiny. Little white bean. Kidney bean, great northern bean, baby lima, southern pea. Nah, I don't know if I got them all or not, but let's plant the rest. Another kidney bean, another black bean, another lima bean, another pinto bean, another little red bean. There we go. <laughs> That's just fun. They fix nitrogen and they're going to give us a little bit of dried beans, but they'll fill in this space for now. I started out gardening as a little kid, planting beans from my mom's pantry. First gardening I ever did was in a class where we had a bag of little beans 
and we got to take a Dixie cup full of soil and we planted beans in them. And when those beans came up, I was hooked. I was very excited. So I went home and I planted pretty much every seed I could find in my mom's pantry. I guess I haven't really stopped. When I was doing research for this book, Totally Crazy Easy Florida Gardening, which has actually been quite a popular book for the state of Florida, my experimentation ran along the lines of how do I grow the most amount of food for the least amount of work in this difficult climate? So we tested crops. We tested crops like cassava and African yams. Those are not sweet potatoes, those are great big cool looking roots. We tested leaf crops that most people hadn't heard of like quail grass and chaya, katuk, the kind of stuff that we thought might grow in this climate. I looked at climates around the world, climates like the Mediterranean where they had warm summers and occasionally froze in the winter. I looked at climates like Africa where it had baking heat at some times of the year, Southeast Asia with high humidity and tropical greens and thousands of years of history of people testing and growing different things and figuring out what worked. And then we took those crops and we planted them on our property to see what would happen. We had to figure out how to eat them. We had to figure out what would do really well, what would live through the freezes we occasionally got in the winter and then come back again and produce again in the spring. It was a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. And what ended up happening was we grew so much food for so little work over time by giving up on the typical Yankee vegetables that everybody wants to tell you how to grow in Florida. You know, people want to know how to grow eggplant and they want to know how to grow pie pumpkins and they want to know how to grow tomatoes. Everybody wants to grow, know how to grow tomatoes, but some of those things just don't do well in Florida. We tested a lot of tomatoes before we found out which tomatoes really did well. It was a little cherry tomatoes. It was old varieties like the Everglades tomato little sweet tomatoes that replant themselves and children totally love them. And all that work ended up going into a book of crops that a lot of people aren't really familiar with, but crops that would produce really well in that climate. When you read gardening books, you don't necessarily get what's going to grow in your area. You might get a book from, you know, New England and you live in Arizona. You might get a book from Southern California where they had nice mild weather, but you live in Minnesota and they say, hey, you have to grow this. This is the greatest thing. It may work. It may not. You have to experiment. You have to just keep experimenting. And again, that's what I want you to do. Just keep experimenting and don't give up. Keep planting a lot of different things. By the way, did anybody else have to send Marjorie Wildcraft one of their fingers to get into this summit? I'm just, just asking. One thing we discovered is that you don't have to have nice beds with nice borders to grow good crops. All you need to do is loosen up the soil well and plant. What I have right here is my trusty Meadow Creature Broad Fork. This thing is a dirt moving machine. I used to do everything by double digging, where you take a spade and a spading fork and you dig trenches and then you loosen the soil down to almost 24 inches and then you plant. That takes a lot of work. The meadow creature made it a lot easier for us. And so experimenting with this thing, um, we did like 10,000 square foot beds on occasion, which is a lot of work, but it's kind of like rowing. It's good work. And we were able to loosen up the soil and plant stuff that we really wouldn't want to to do in regular raised beds. I don't want to spend the money. I don't want to take the time. I don't want to do all the, you know, well, let's see, pressure treated wood is bad, but cedar is expensive and cinder blocks might leach bad stuff and tires might leach bad stuff. And I thought, why are we doing this? You know, uh, the settlers didn't have perfect square box backyard beds and they grew a lot of food and they grew food to survive. So we have the innovation of the meadow creature, which allows us to go real simple and to dig out the ground and plant crops without a lot of work.
and the work is on the front end, you know, but it's not nearly as bad. I would much rather broad fork for a couple of hours than measure and cut and put up beds that in a few years are going to rot away and I got to do it again. Kind of a cool tool and another experiment that we found worked. The crops love that loosened soil. These tines are 14 inches long and they make short work even of sod. They move rocks. I love this thing. It's fantastic. In a bug out situation you could mount this on the front of your van and run through zombies. So what really happened to my finger? Well, I got pulled over by the fashion police who saw this shirt and I left the finger behind much like a lizard drops its tail, hopefully to distract them. And it did. I just ran. I had to get back here and film this video. Thank you for joining me today. It was fun. Hope you had a good time. And I hope that you're not afraid anymore. I hope that you're gonna go out and experiment and be a scientist and share your experiments with me too. I'd love to see what you're doing. You can find me on the web at thesurvivalgardener.com and be sure to go subscribe to my YouTube channel because I post experiments there all the time. Tons and tons of crazy experiments and some stuff that has really worked well. I will catch up with you soon and until then, keep growing. Come on, baby, let's look at Chopping on a coconut and whack two tendons Off to the surgeon with two nurses in attendance Can't play guitar so I'm spitting rhymes instead I'll let my mad blade skills go right to my head Pride goes before a fall or cut to the hand Now I'm stuck in a cast cause my finger got canned